everyone. Welcome to Real Dad Speak. I'm your host, Sarah McClure. I met my guest today last year when we were both working at the mall. I'll talk to him today about raising his son who has cerebral palsy, along with raising his other kids who are now adults. We'll talk about the love, patience, awareness, and resources that are needed to raise a child with cerebral palsy. My guest today is Jeff Diddy. Thank you, Jeff, for coming to the podcast. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me, sir. All right. Well, I usually start off with basic questions like, uh, where did you grow up and what did your parents do for a living? Uh, I grew up in uh, northwest Detroit, uh, Seven Mile and Greenfield area. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. I was the youngest of four kids, and uh, it wasn't until I got later into high school or junior high and was able to be alone that uh, she actually had a couple of master's degrees, but she started uh, uh, operating or teaching in uh, daycare centers. And what, But primarily when I was younger, she was a stay-at-home mom. And my dad worked for the uh, stock exchange in Detroit. He was a CPA. Okay. Wow. And so you have four uh, siblings. How many brothers? How many sisters? I have an older brother and two older sisters. Okay. Oh, it's just four of you guys. Okay. Are you very close? Uh, yeah. Nobody lives around here. The closest one is my older sister who's in Davison, uh, Michigan. Uh, the other ones live in uh, Big Rapids. Okay. All right. So you have how many children? I have five children. I have a 27-year-old son, Matthew, who's down in Ohio, um, and I have a 24-year-old twins. Uh, one is Adam, who's got cerebral palsy, and I have 19-year-old twins. So I have five kids, two sets of twins. Wow. So which side of the family did that come from, your mom or your dad? Uh, as I tell people, they come from Dr. Abelzeed. <laughs> My uh, after my first son was born, my uh, uh, wife had two ectopic pregnancies, and she was told that she would never have uh, be able to have children again. Um, and so we ended up doing in vitro for both of my uh, twins. Oh, okay, all right. So uh, you guys, you and your uh, siblings are close. How about your kids? Have you trained them or taught them to be like you and your sisters and brothers to be close like that? You raise them like that? Uh, my kids are all pretty close. Uh, they're at that age where they're kind of, you know, they're my youngest twins are in college. Uh, my uh, Catherine is uh, working at General Motors and my oldest boy is down in Ohio. He, he was with Honeywell Corporation. He just got hired by another company. Uh, uh, he does uh, conveyor systems and things like that. But uh, so they're they're close, but they're kind of getting farther apart because of the um, just the distances and things starting to have their own little life and stuff okay. exactly all right so eventually one day you you'll become a grandpa right i am a grandpa now my oh. oldest boy has a three-year-old daughter and a one and a half year old son so okay well good for you yeah okay so uh your son who has cerebral palsy what's his name adam his name is adam okay so uh what did you and your wife, I mean, how did you find out that he had cerebral palsy? Um, he was the second of the twins born. And when they, uh, after he was delivered, and it was a tough delivery, and after he was delivered, they uh, took him immediately to the ICU and they were uh, doing uh, ventilation with them with the uh, mini ambu bag. And I've done CPR and hundreds of people and I told the doctor, this isn't good, is it? He says, no, it's not. Uh, so that was our first clue that he was being, uh, he was being assisted in his breathing. And he was in ICU for two weeks and they called and said he can go home. And then that was the first time the one doctor who we had never met was on duty at that time that he said that uh, there was a chance that he had uh, cerebral palsy. You know, and uh, that's the first time we'd ever heard of it, you know, you know that with him. They'd never talked about it with him before. And, of course, that started things rolling. And then uh, as he progressed in that, it became more and more apparent that he, uh, he was going to have severe cerebral palsy. So. Now, what exactly is cerebral palsy? Uh, it's Doctors a, told you, I should say. <laughs> it's a... Um, 
it, it's a uh, condition in the in the brain caused. Uh, sometimes it's caused by lack of oxygen. Uh, if the uh, uh, cord gets wrapped around the neck or something. In his case, uh, it was uh, it was brain trauma. Uh, he had uh, had uh, he had had uh, uh, forceps used on him, and they weren't used properly. Oh, wow. So, okay, so when you heard, you and your wife heard this, I mean, what was your feelings and immediate reaction to, like? Uh, it was kind of shock in a way, but we're both kind of, you know, we take things as they come. And, you know, uh, I have a 100% belief that God has a plan for everything. So uh, we just, uh, when we first heard it, of course, we were shocked. And because uh, nobody had told us that before. <laughs> And we left the hospital, and uh, and we just we obviously we had doctor's appointments to follow up and things like that, and uh, it became more and more apparent, you know, after a year or so that he was uh, he was going to have some severe um, disabilities. So what it was, does it mean? He wouldn't be able to speak. He wouldn't be able to walk, run. What exactly are the symptoms uh, when you diagnose with it? He was just very behind in everything that you know. Uh, that uh, he was doing, uh, you know, even even little things, everything that a normal baby would do, he was not doing, uh, and he was very behind in it. I'm having a hard time with my camera here. So okay, it's still now, <laughs> uh -huh. moving, you are moving a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get a camera view here. All right, I'll try to hold it steady. Okay. So it just as he grows like a year and eighteen months and that, it became very apparent. That he was, you know, not keeping up. We had a, we were kind of fortunate in a way. We had his sister, uh, who we could compare his development to, and it was, it was very obvious that he was developing uh, slower than her. Okay, okay. But was he able? He could do everything. He it just took him longer. So like he, for him to crawl, it took me instead of crawling at six or seven months, he crawled at a year. Um, I that. don't know that he ever really crawled. I don't remember him, you know, crawling at the at, in with the first couple of years. So, okay. all right. So walking and you know what they say, rolling over and all that stuff that uh, they're supposed to do at a certain time. He didn't do any of that. As Correct. Okay. Correct. So uh, I remember one time a buddy of mine was over and he was on the, uh, I had him laying on the couch or something. And he said, uh, aren't you worried he's going to roll over? And I'm like, that would be a good thing if he rolled over. So, uh. <laughs> yes, it, it was just stuff like that. The normal, normal babies would do and stuff that he was not doing at all. So once you uh, realized this and they told you what immediate changes did you have to make did you make immediate changes to, you know, help improve his quality of life or, you know? Um, as, as a, as a infant, there wasn't a lot of changes really to do with it. You know, I mean, it was just monitoring his development and, uh, and, and, you know, kind of just basically just monitoring and see where it's at. I mean, we were seeing neurologists and things. And uh, I remember at one point in time, the neurologist was doing some vision testing with him. And uh, he's, he's also legally blind. I mean, he could see, but it's, his vision's very poor. And they were doing the vision testing with him at a very young age. And they were telling us that his vision was very bad. Okay, wow. Um, so as he got older, um, was he able to go to school, attend school and participate in activities and stuff? Um, he was obviously in special ed, special ed classes and that, uh, and he was started receiving therapies and the speech therapies, occupational therapy, physical therapy and all those. Um, so at one point when he was very small, I mean, probably like prior to being, uh, in his four or five years old, he could walk with a walker and he would walk up and down the street. It was a struggle with him and he would. He had, uh, by that time, he had had uh, braces put on and stuff, uh, but he could walk with a walker, and uh, eventually he lost that. Uh, everything got tightened up. He's been all over the country to various uh, uh, doctors. 
He's had uh, uh, percutaneous uh, surgeries, which uh, they take the, uh, the coating on the tendons and they perforate it to try to allow the tendons to stretch a little farther. He's had his hips rebuilt, both hips rebuilt by a doctor in New Jersey, same one that did the percutaneous uh, 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 procedures. Uh, he also started having seizure disorder at about two or three. And he had at one time he had a vagal nerve stimulator put in his chest, which uh, has a wire that goes up under the skin and it goes onto the vagal nerve uh, feeding the brain. And that was supposed to electrically stimulate and prevent seizures. It did not. We battled seizures for many years with him. He still has four seizure beds that he takes every day, twice a day. Uh, fortunately, he hasn't had any major seizures in a while. So, wow, that's that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, it's it's a lot. He's he's been he's been through an awful lot. Right, right. And your your his mom have had to, and his siblings. I'm sure. How did his siblings? I mean, when he was able to walk on the cane, he was out at, and then all of a sudden he couldn't. What was their response? I mean, how did they feel about that? Uh, the walking actually was kind of slow. Uh, it was, uh, it wasn't like automatically, it was over time. He lost it. Um, so it's just, uh, the tendons and everything keep tightening up and, uh, to the point where he eventually, he, he, you know, he, uh, his standing was very, uh, his legs were very deformed and everything, you know, and it, it just wasn't, he just couldn't pull the, put the feet in front of the other to do the walking. So it will cause for your uh, joints and stuff to lock up several paws. It will call for your joints to stop growing or? Uh, it's more the muscles tighten up and everything, okay. the tendons and the ligaments and everything tighten up. Okay. Cerebral palsy has, cerebral palsy has a real right, wide range from very mild. Uh, if you ever see anybody that's kind of like, uh, they might look like they're very pigeon-toed. It could cause the towing in or, you know, they'll walk very pigeon-toed. That could be cerebral palsy, you know, a mild case of it. Uh, it also could be very mild or very um, advanced as far as uh, cognitive. My son, is uh, his cognitive is very severe also. I mean, he he can understand a lot. Some things he's very good at, computers and uh, numbers and stuff he does pretty good at, better than me. Uh, <laughs> but most things, he's nonverbal. He does not talk. He can say a couple words. Uh, he can say da-da. Uh, he has a girl at school. He's managed to say uh, her name. Uh, he says Hannah. Her name's Hannah. He'll say Hannah. But for the most part, he's uh, he's nonverbal. He does a lot of sign language. Some of it's uh, standard stuff. Uh, some of it's stuff that we created, or he's just done things that we've figured out that this is what he wants. And so okay. we, uh, and so we, uh, you know, like he'll if he has a drink on the table with the with a straw, he, he, with me, all he has to do is kind of put his arm out, and I know he wants a drink. Okay. You know? uh, it's just you realize after a while that that's his that's his sign for a drink. You know, he'll put his arm up in the air. Uh, that'll mean he wants to go to school. Um, there's some other ones he has. Uh, he has one where he touches one of his wrists with his finger. And that means he's asking about his caregiver, Lori. You know, is she going to be, I'll tell him Lori's going to pick you up, uh, you know, today or whatever. So he, he can get his, he can get his message across pretty good. I mean, we understand it. Most people probably would have a hard time or we'd have to translate it. But uh he does a good job of it. He, he he gets what he wants. He does. He can crawl around on the floor. We call it the bunny hop. Instead of doing like a normal crawling, uh, like he puts like two hands out and he pulls two knees up. And, okay. uh, and the problem the is with that is he got bursitis in his both his knees. And so we have to limit that uh, a lot because it's too hard on his knees. Wow. He has been through a lot, and I know you guys have too. How did you manage this? I mean, you worked in your uh, career for over 30 years. Did you, you and your wife take turns doing raising? I mean, how did you manage to raise him and go through all of this, taking all these operations? How were you able? Uh, fortunately, with with my job as a police officer, I had a you know I had been there for a while. Had a I had a fair amount of vacation time and other time off that I could take for like to take him out to New Jersey for surgeries and stuff. 
I think he went off to New Jersey five separate times. Um, uh, my uh, wife was a stay-at-home mom, so uh, she basically took, did most of the care for him. Um, I, I can tell you there, there, the, there was a lawsuit there. Uh, the hospital did make mistakes. They admitted it. Uh, actually, the gentleman from the hospital, the head of their legal department, was amazing. He, uh, when everything was all said and done, uh, our attorneys told us that he offered uh, lifetime therapies for Adam, um, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, uh, and he, uh, he and uh, our attorney said, we didn't even ask for it. He wanted to give that to Adam. And so, uh, so yeah, so, uh, and he followed up on a regular basis with everything. I could tell you stories about how fantastic this guy was. Uh, he developed a very good relationship with my uh, wife, his mom, Adam's mom, my ex-wife now. And he, uh, he would follow up on a regular basis and anything she needed, if it was a therapist or uh, a therapist that, you know, couldn't make it there, he would make sure that she was there. Just tell us what you need. Uh, and it was absolutely, he was absolutely awesome what he, what he did for, for Adam and that and my, and my ex. So. And this is the doctor that actually made the mistake. No, this is this was the tournament. vice president that was the head of the legal department for the hospital. Wow. He was the vice president. Um, you know, wow. you know, at one point in time, my uh, my wife's doctor, we were actually to a hospital that we were in there. Um, um, uh, we because of my they thought something was on my daughter's lung. Uh, his sister, we had gone to the maternal medicine department at another hospital, uh, an affiliated hospital, mm -hmm. and. Um, and when she went, we had our second twin, she went back to the, uh, her original doctor who had taken on a younger guy. And he basically, after a few visits, told her he couldn't see her again. And my wife, we pretty much figured it was because of the lawsuit. He, he had found out about the lawsuit. And long story short, the, the vice president of their legal department, uh, told her that, uh, the, the doctor, her doctor would see her now. She says, well, he doesn't want to. And, uh, you know, she said, he doesn't want to see me. He told me he didn't want to. He said, I told him he will, and you can go there. And wow. uh, she ended up not going there because obviously, uh, uh, you know, she, she didn't feel comfortable with him after right. he said that he didn't want to see her. Uh, so she went to a hustle down in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of amazing because the, we were very close to the hospital we were at. And he said, well, what are you going to do if you have an emergency? She goes, well, I guess we'll drive fast. And he says, no. He said, you, uh, he said, you take down my, these phone numbers. He said, this is my cell phone. This is my direct line. This is my pager. He goes, if you have an emergency, he says, you go to the hospital, you know, the, the, our hospital, he goes and call me on the way. He goes, and you will be taken care of. Wow. But he was pretty amazing. That's nice. Very rare for, you know, because you think the attorneys, all they want is just the money, but he cared, He actually cared about the welfare of your child. Yeah, and he, he cared about my wife and that, too. They uh, they really had a lot of talks and a lot of conversations, and um, he was he was pretty incredible. So, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he did. Uh, 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 therapists that had left their hospital system, Mm -hmm. uh, he said, we'll hire him to come in on Saturday if you want him. She goes, well, it doesn't work for their hospital anymore. He goes, doesn't matter. We'll make it worth their while to do that. He was, he bent over backwards to, uh, to make sure that Adam got everything he needed. Uh, as a matter of fact, when she first started going to the therapy center, uh, for the hospital, she got to know the, uh, physical therapist and she really liked them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, finally after, you know, several months of going there, she asked him, she goes, he goes, were you aware of Adam, you know, before we got here? He goes, everybody was aware. He goes, he goes, Mr. Uh, uh, I won't say his name, but he, he called and uh, he told us whatever Mrs. Denny wants, she gets. Wow. But, but, uh, but part of that, I think, was we, were, we made it very clear to him that we were not upset with the doctors. You know, it was a mistake. There were mistakes right. made, but that uh, we understand that that could happen. Um, as a matter of fact, my son, uh, Adam, uh, 
we couldn't figure out a middle name for him. And so uh, uh, we told the doctor the day of the delivery that we were going to name him after him. Oh. You know, after his, and it's funny because his name wasn't what we thought it was. You know? <laughs> Is we yeah, we's going to name his middle name Christopher after a doctor. He goes, well, my name's not Christopher. My name is legally Chris T. And he goes, oh. uh, I was born in Corpus Christi. My mom didn't have a name for me, so she called me Chris T. <laughs> and it was kind of funny, you know, but that you know, yeah. but it's well, he's going to be Christopher. So, <laughs> yeah, well, that is beautiful. So now. You had all these physical therapists when he was born. He still needs help now. Does he need an assistant now? Uh, yeah, he's in a wheelchair now. He doesn't walk okay. anymore. I said he can hop around on the floor. Um, however, he uh, um, we have to limit that because of the uh, bursitis that built up in his knees. He's had to have his knees drained a couple times from fluid. And uh, so that's limited now, not like it used to be. Uh, he sees, uh, he's in what's called post high. He graduated from high school okay. and, uh, he stayed an extra year in the high school. That was an option that they had for us. And he loves school. He really loves school. He loves going to school. And so, uh, now he goes to post high school and they are totally amazing. They're very, very amazing. And, uh, so he's out for a summer now, but, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he gets his therapies and stuff now through the schools. So how do you select the therapists or, you know, the helpers, the caregivers for them? Do you, I mean, how do you, how do you select them? Well, uh, the schools do the, the therapy is done through the schools and okay. stuff, you know, on a regular basis. Um, uh, he has, he has a, a caregiver that comes in, uh, picks him up from school and brings him home and then does some stuff with them and then uh, feeds him and uh, gives him his medication and stuff. And then uh, it's only for a couple hours a day. Um, so it's, we've been very blessed. We've had two caregivers. Um, they've both been, he just adores both of them. They adore him. Uh, the one has been with them for several years. And she thought she was moving to Florida last year. And so we hired a new caregiver. Mm -hmm. And it, as it turns out, uh, they, they, they're selling their house fell through. And the, care, the new caregiver we hired had back problems and couldn't lift him. And so the, fortunately, the, the old caregiver was still available. And now she's been with them and we're trying to, she's still trying to move to Florida. But we're uh, hopefully the, uh, the second caregiver, her back will be better enough, well enough to take care of them. So that's kind of up in the air right now. How did you select the caregiver? Did you select? Uh, no, my, my wife would put ads, ads out in... Uh, and uh, interview people, and then she would take who she thought was the best. And uh, she's uh, she's had a lot of hiring experience in her previous employment, okay. so uh, uh, it was pretty. It's not you know it's it's hard finding people that really right. are dedicated. I mean, it, it's just um, it's very hard. And she's we've been very fortunate. The two we've had uh, have just been awesome. They've been very good. So, was there anything that stood out about? Uh, the first one that made you say, yeah, she's the one or. Just... I don't remember. I don't remember the first one that much. Uh, I think, and I can't remember if she was a referral. She might've been referred to us by somebody uh, that knew her. Um, but the second one, um, uh, she's actually from England. She's only been here two or three years. We'll be right back after this break. If you or someone you know would like more information about cerebral palsy, cerebral palsy, or CP, click on one of the links below. Plan to be more than a father. Become a dad by taking an active role in your child's life. Welcome back, everybody, to Real Dad Speak. My guest again today is... Uh, Jeff Denny, and we're talking about cerebral palsy, raising a child with cerebral palsy. And so, um, Jeff, um, how has your son's abilities changed as he's gotten older? Uh, it really hasn't changed. He's matured. Um, he's got things he likes to do and things, you know, 
pretty much. He's a very, very, very happy uh, young man. He's 24 now. Um, uh, the one thing I'd like to say is the people that have uh, in the schools and stuff that have worked with them and his caregivers, obviously, but the people that are the teachers and the para pros that have worked with him over the years in high school and now in post high are just absolutely awesome. I tell people there's a there's a special place in heaven for them. Um, I like to tell the story about uh, when he graduated from high school with his sister, who's who's like scary smart. She's very brilliant. Um, uh, the teacher came approached my wife and said, uh, you know, she has the option to keep Adam in the high school one more year before sending him to post high, but it had to be agreed upon by both her and Adam's mom, you know, his, uh, my wife. And she said, do you want me to keep him another year? And she said, absolutely. He loves it. He loves being in high school and being with all the other kids and stuff. And, uh, so she told the para pro, uh, uh, Rhonda that was working with them for a couple of years that she was going to keep Adam for another year. And she was like, damn it. And she goes, what's the matter? She goes, I was waiting for him to graduate so I could retire. And she pulled her, <laughs> she pulled her papers and stayed another year rather wow. than retire because she wanted to see him graduate, you know, see him until he went, left the high school. I mean, that's just incredible. That is just beautiful. incredible. That's so, beautiful. Wow. But, uh, so we've been, we've been very, very blessed, uh, with all the, uh, you know, the caregivers, the therapists, the teachers, mm -hmm. everybody has been really phenomenal with him. And he has that personality. He is always happy, Sarah. He is yeah. always happy. And he's changed my life in that, I think we talked about this before, in that when I look at him and he can be happy in his mm -hmm. situation, there is no way that I cannot be happy with mine. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. he's just... Uh, He's, a, he's an inspiration to anybody, you know, he just, uh, he's got that magnetic personality that you just want to be around. So, mm, good, good. So what type of activities you said that, uh, one of his characters, you take him to the mall, take him to the movies. Does he still like to do that? Like, does he like to go outside? Fish, oh yeah. Be on he the loves boat? it. He, he, he lives, I mean, talk about sign language. The first thing he does when he gets up is he points to the window, which means I want to go outside. Okay. And he, lo he loves to watch me uh, cut the grass. Um, he loves to go on motorcycle rides. I have a, a three-wheeled motorcycle that, uh, so that I don't have to worry about it tipping over or anything. Uh, we don't go on main roads very just a little bit up to the park, but mostly in the subdivisions. He loves that. Um, so he's just uh, he's got a need. The boy's got a need for speed. He would just he loves just going <laughs> for a ride in a car. I have an older Corvette convertible he he even he has signs that go like this that means go for a ride in the, in the corvette um yeah. he, he just uh he loves doing that stuff i have a i have a little plastic wagon pretty good sized wagon that i hook up to my uh, lawnmower uh -huh. and it's his favorite thing is to hook that up and then just drive around my lot and stuff and <laughs> and uh, he, i got padding and blankets in the back and, and he bounces mm -hmm. around and just thinks it's the funnest thing ever. That's his. That's his. That's his biggest joy in life. And that that's the first like thing it. he wakes up. First thing he wakes up, he points outside, and I go, "You want to cut the grass?" And he goes, "Yes." You know. <laughs> if life could always be this simple, right? <laughs> oh my God, yes. If it could be simple for us like that, so. Oh yeah, he sounds like an inspiration. He sounds like an inspiration. He, he's changed my life so much. Like I said, you know. I can't, I have a hard time complaining about anything now because I look at him and he's, uh, he's blessed me so much and just showing me that, you know, it doesn't take a lot to be happy. Right, right, right. That's beautiful, Jeff. That's beautiful. Well, we come to the part of my show where I ask you the final five questions or statements. I may ask you a question and I may give you a statement to ask you to fill in the blank. Okay. So my first my first question is, what advice would you give to a parent of a child with cerebral palsy um, when it comes to things that they should not do? Or, um, that's a good question. Uh, the one thing we always, uh, the one thing we, uh, my wife was very involved in the ARC of Oakland County. Um, okay. As a matter of fact, someone just told me they, there's a video that she did uh, probably 20, 15, 20 years ago that resurfaces every now and then. And somebody just told me they saw it on the air the other day. Uh, so 
we've had a lot of contact, but one thing we started from day one is we didn't treat them any different from my other kids. Uh, yeah. If we didn't tolerate bad behavior from him, not that he had a lot of bad behavior, mm -hmm. but we didn't, we didn't, uh, when he was very little, we didn't excuse it because he, um, you know, because he had uh, special needs and stuff. And I think a lot of, some people will tend to not to discipline or do stuff because they feel bad for the child as it is. And then you have a child with special needs that is undisciplined. And we, 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 we treated him like we did the other kids. I mean, if he was doing something, he wasn't listening. We took him out of the room or had a timeout or whatever and, and said, it's not going to be tolerated. And I think that's done a lot to that. You know, he, he uh, doesn't have his, uh, the, the issues, you know, that some, you know, adults without special needs do. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, okay. we, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't give him any slack because, because he had special needs or anything. We treat, you know, right. we expected behavior out of him and he, and he's done it. He's, he's followed through really good. Good. All right. Second question. What was the biggest hurdle in your son's life so far? What do you think it was so far? <sighs> Probably the biggest hurdle was getting beyond the seizures. If you've known anybody that's had uh, seizures or somebody that has a child that has seizures, it's very, very, very frustrating uh, because we learned through all this whole process that the medical community has learned, has come so far uh, so quickly. But when it comes to the brain, they're still like, it's like unknown territory. And uh, when he started having, he started having uh, very minor little twitching seizures, and then they progressed into like five or six second twitching seizures. Then they started into grand malls. And at that point, uh, uh, we ended up taking him down to uh, 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 the hospital in uh, uh, Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic. And they were supposed to have a pretty good uh, 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 seizure department. So I took him down there. I spent like three days with him, and it was so strange. And you you wonder why things happen the way they do. And so they went over all the records with him. I had to sit there with a little button and uh, watch him. And every time he had a seizure, they had a camera on him. I would click the button, and it would mark a seizure. These were the little like twitching seizures. Huh? And um, and so uh, I said, "How long do I have to do this?" And the guy says, "Well, you got to do it for like." you know, 24 hours. I'm like, Oh God. <laughs> and, uh, after an hour he had about, he had had about 10 seizures in the first hour. Or so they came in and said, we've got enough. And wow. I talked to the doctor before we went back to Michigan. He said, you know, it looks like the, the neurologists and everybody up here are doing everything that we would do. He says, the only medication we haven't tried is, um, an old liquid medication for seizures. One of the first anti-seizure meds. And, uh, so he prescribed that and we got back up here. We got it for him. Didn't do a darn thing except it made him drool like a faucet. He would just, just drool coming out of his mouth. So the neurologist up here said, well, that's not a problem. We'll get a, get him a drying agent that dries his mouth up. And she said, give him, start him off on half a dose for a week. And then another, the full dose after a week. And so my wife gave him the, um, uh, half a dose and three days later, his seizures had cut gone cut in half. Wow. So, she, so she gave him the full dose and he stopped seizing. And she called the neurologist and uh, she says, that has nothing to do with the seizures, but it obviously does. And that was the breakthrough that we were looking for. And since then, I mean, he's had seizures, but for the most part now he's like 90, I want to jinx myself. He's like, uh, he's probably like 97% seizure free. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, and it was just a fluke thing that they tried this thing, and it was actually mm -hmm. the drooling med, that uh, the drying med, that uh, actually, uh, we believe, and the neurologist is of the opinion, too, it, for whatever reason, it stopped the seizures. So he gets that seizure medication, that medication, along with his uh, seizure medications now. Wow. So that was the biggest hurdle. That was so frustrating because there's mm -hmm. nothing you can do when your son has a seizure, you know, and you're watching it, and you, you don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, he had startle seizures, which was interesting because sometimes if uh, something dropped and made a sharp noise, it could set him into a seizure. And we learned that we were able to talk, if we got it quick enough, we were able to talk him out of the seizures. 
we'd get them to focus back on us and talk to them. And you could see him, once he started focusing back on us, the seizure would go away before it started. And sometimes you wouldn't get it in time or sometimes it wouldn't, he'd go into a full blown seizure. But actually most of the time we were able to, to you know, get him to focus on us and get out of the seizure. And it's pretty incredible. I've never heard of that happening before. Wow. The, the miracles of medicine, man. Yeah. Right. It's just, well, it's, 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 I think it's got something to do with uh, the man upstairs. I Absolutely. really do. Absolutely. I agree. All right. Number three, how did you manage to provide extra care for your son and also provide just the regular care for your other children? How did you manage? Um, Not, well, I feel different. Uh, we were fortunate. Like I said, my, my wife was a stay at home mom. Uh, and I was pretty active with the, I was active with a lot of the other kids. We tried to, uh, always tried to keep him, whatever the other kids were doing. If it was, if they were going to, uh, my son was playing hockey or my daughter was playing softball. He always went with us. You know, he had a wheel, he had not, at that point he had a stroller, not a wheelchair, but we always made sure that he went with us you know, on stuff if it was possible. And, uh, so yeah, it, you just do it, I guess is what I was, what I was going to say is you just do it. You don't yeah. ask about it. You don't question it. You just, it's, it's accepted, you know, and uh, we were very fortunate. So. That's good. All right. Number four, uh, finish this sentence for me. I believe the biggest misconception about cerebral palsy is. Boy, that is a good, that's a tough question. Um, because the spectrum of cerebral palsy is so uh, wide like I said, it can be anything from, say, uh, uh, a little uh, a pointing of the uh, toes in, you know, and when someone's mm -hmm. walking uh, and no cognitive impairment whatsoever, or it could be like my son who's considered severely impaired. Uh, so I think it's not really a misconception. I just think people don't understand it, you know. Um, so as you, as you know, we worked at the mall together and stuff, and and uh, I always make a point, if I can, when somebody comes by with a child or an adult that's obviously either got cerebral palsy or some kind of other condition that they're severely impaired, I always ask them if I can talk to them. And I do. So it's just, uh, I think sometimes people are afraid to talk to them or scared, you know, or don't want to, or just, you know, don't know what to say in that. And uh, it, that's kind of so hard sometimes, you know, so. Or sometimes people are rude. You're trying to get a, a wheelchair or a stroller through a store and people don't even like move to let you go by. So it, it's just, you know, they're, they're, but it's, they're relatively minor. The things are relatively minor. Okay. All right. My last uh, question. What is your favorite part about being your son's dad? Uh, favorite part is just being with him. He, uh, he loves to be with me. You know, I, uh, taking them on in the, the car or the motorcycle or the, the, the hooking up the trailer to my tractor and, and driving them around the yard. Um, that's my favorite part. Uh, so, you know, he's just, uh, he's one happy little guy. You know, he, I wish all my kids were as happy as him to be quite <laughs> honest with you. Uh, he's just, uh, just being with them. Uh, he, you know, he has to be, he has to be hand fed and stuff like that. He, has very limited, uh, you know, uh, arm movement and stuff. He, he can do some things. He can he can operate an iPad or a, what an iPad or whatever and stuff like better than I can. Uh, mm -hmm. He's good at some things, but other things he's you know you have to do it for him. And uh, but just just spending you know now spending time with him. I have him every other weekend. And now I de I dedicate my weekends. It's I don't plan anything else. I just plan on, you know, uh, being with him. You know. So that's my favorite part about it is just uh, spending time with him. He's just, he is an inspiration. He really is. You know, he sounds like it. He sounds he, like he, it. Very positive. He, very, he's happy. very positive. Very happy. Very rarely ever, you know, got an attitude or angry or anything. Um, so it just, he's, he's, uh, you just, you just like spending time with him. He's changed not only my life, but he's changed a lot of lives. He really has. People that know him, the, the caregivers talk. The one caregiver that you know, her back is there. She calls, talks to me. She says, "I miss him so much. You know, I just want to come see him." So, that's but, beautiful. That's yeah, beautiful. it is. 
Well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you sharing your stories with us. Well, I appreciate you having me. It's, it's been uh, fun. Yes, you take care. I have to come and see you sometime at your uh, job. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I, uh, yeah, I just, I just left the job last night, so I think I'm going to okay. go into full retirement. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, well, you, 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 caught me off, me. you caught me off guard with that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll talk later about it. All right. Yeah, you can call me All anytime, right. Sarah. All right. Thanks, Jack. Right. You have a good one now. You too. Thanks.